What kind of world do I want to live in? I think about this question a lot. For our generation and for specifically my group of people, which is refugees, the circumstances might dismantle any vision of the future that we have. You're trying to rebuild, you're trying to make a future for yourself, and then the climate related disaster comes and you start again. It's not about how it's affecting you now, it's about how it's affecting you your entire life. First step to understand is that we're all a part of it. None of us are going to be left out by the crisis. We're at a stage where if we don't act now, really there won't be very much left. There are generations that will never see certain things that we grew up seeing in real life. We have to start treating this like the emergency it is. To achieve the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, we have to go from an intention to a serious commitment. Business leaders really need to rethink how they conduct their business and invest in creating systems that are climate friendly. The action I would like to see is accountability. Structures being put in place where countries aren't just asked to do something, but they're kept accountable to the decisions that they make. There has to be that strong collaboration between government, between corporations, between youth activists to drive change forward. The world I would want to live in is a world where imagining the future is not a privilege. I want to live in a world where people do not give up on hope, hope that a positive change is possible. The fact that you're listening today means that you are willing to make a change. Hello and welcome to the Impact Session, Navigating the Path to Net Zero. The challenge is clear, 50 free gross, gross tonnage, GT, that is the amount of CO2 emissions per year that need to be eliminated by 2050 to avoid dangerous climate change. What isn't clear are the pathways the world must navigate to get to net zero. Nearly every nation on earth has endorsed the Paris Climate Agreement. Industry commitments on climate actions have doubled over the last 12 months, and over two-thirds of global citizens are alarmed and concerned about climate change. All stakeholders, governments, industries, and citizens must now come together to radically reinvent and decarbonize the global economy. Now is the time to establish the shared priorities, structures and initiatives that will lay the foundation to accelerate progress towards the goal of net zero. And that is what we're going to be talking about today, how we can meet the challenge of our age and what we can learn from one another. My name is Laura Round and I'll be your moderator for this session. I work at the international PR agency Freud's and I'm seconded to the Prince of Wales' Sustainable Markets Initiative, which is working with CEOs and chief sustainability officers around the world to accelerate the green transition. However, I am mainly here in my capacity as a WEF Global Shaper from London. I feel strongly, as I'm sure many of you do, that this is a generational issue. But people making se senior decisions are not the people who will be living with this as much as the next generations. The magnitude of the decisions we're making right now are enormous. And I am delighted to be joined today by three dynamic thought leaders. So let me introduce you to our panel. Firstly, we have Michelle Fredo, Managing Director and Senior Partner at the Boston Consulting Group, joining us from Paris. Varun Sivaram, Senior Director for Clean Energy and Innovation for the U.S. Department of State from Washington, D.C. Virginie Helias, Chief Sustainability Officer at Procter & Gamble from Geneva. 
And in this most recent US presidential election, climate change was a top priority for the first time. President Biden has returned to the US, um, has returned the US to uh, the Paris Agreement and has committed to net zero emissions by 2050. So where do we stand today in terms of global commitments as we head towards COP26? And what's still to be done there, do you think? Virginie, would you like to take that, out, that, that question first then, please? Yes, sure. So maybe I will ground everybody on, on what we announced um, last week, because we um, we announced uh, our commitment to be net zero by 2040 on September 14th. And um, this is a, a commitment that is across our operation uh, and our supply chain, you know, from raw material to retailers. And we also publish a very detailed climate transition action plan, you know, that outlines to your point, not just the, the, the end destination, but what is the pathway to get there. And so that's why we have interim target by 2030 on um, what we want to do uh, in terms of our operation, our supply chain. So, you know, carbon neutrality over 2020, 2030, 40% uh, reduction in our supply chain emission, 50% efficiency in our uh, transportation emission by 2030 on the way uh, to net zero. So we, we, we joined the race, but, you know, the, the climate work for, for us is not new, actually. We've been at it for over a decade. Um, you know, we've been working on reducing our emission end-to-end, -end, you know, from sourcing to manufacturing all the way to in use how, you know, the, the emission um, that people emit when they use our product uh, and just, you know, to ground it into our product, you know, this white pampers today, supply chain generates 1 million tons fewer greenhouse gas emission compared to a decade ago, and, and because they significantly reduce the amount of material. And this is why Thai detergent has avoided 15 million tons of CO2 by uh, enabling people to wash their clothes in, in cold water. So the focus is not new, but what is new is the scope of our missions, you know, the, the, the breadth, the, the depth, and the long-term view because historically we had goals, uh, but there were five-year goals, there were 10-year goals. So we never had an ambition 19 years away. And I think that's really the challenge, especially in a culture like PNG, um, because when we set goals, you know, we deliver. I mean, we call it, you know, we have plans of our pledges. Uh, 19 years, that means that we need to know how to deal with many sources of uncertainties, and I will probably talk about those, but, you know, and we spell them out very transparently in our climate transition action plan, you know. Uh, that's, that goes from how greenhouse gas emissions are accounted for today, which is a nation practice and it can involve, I mean, all the way to how fast low carbon technology will scale. I mean, those are huge sources of uncertainty. And, and so our current roadmaps, the pathways are based on what we believe to be true today, but we can't predict, you know, with certainty how those enabling technology may advance, you know. So that's an answer we need to learn how to flex, you know, navigating with a very high level of uncertainty while staying focused on the net zero uh, ultimate goal. Well, this is a really timely conversation for you because you have just uh, very recently expanded those climate commitment commitments, as you've just outlined, as well as joining the race to zero. And what I'm particularly interested to hear from you is what that process process was like to get to those new commitments to to get your company to sign up and commit to race to zero. And also, you know, what, you, know you sort of touched on why it's so important, but why was that so important? How did that drive the entire company to really get behind this? Mm. So it was a long and tedious process, obviously, because I think what's different with this goal versus the previous one is that although we have a few corporate programs, but the majority of our efforts have to be delivered by and through our business units. You know, when you talk about decarbon decarbonization of your supply chain, there is no way that it can be bolted on. I mean, it has to be totally um, integrated in the in the BU um, innovation program. So, you know, this is why the goals are so important because it is about um, a business practice 
practice transformation. Um, and, um, and it involves now every single employee. You know, just as you say, two thirds of uh, people are feeling that they are personally affected by climate change. I mean, I think now we can say that all PNG employees are with these new commitments personally engaged in finding a solution. So that's very exciting. But it took a lot of internal consultation to make sure that those goals were actually um, actionable, that, that we could fit them into our existing uh, processes and systems, you know. Uh, so we are talking about a complete re-engineering of how we do business. And, and that's the part that takes time. Um, that, that's also uh, where we uh, realize that a big part of it we cannot do alone. And that's also culturally, you know, uh, a big difference. I used to say, I mean, we have, we have been raised to, on how to compete. You know, that's a muscle we know. How to collaborate is a totally different muscle. We'll talk about that, I think, later. But... Um, I think we need to talk about culture change. We need to talk about re-engineering of how we do business. Um, so that's a lot of work, but now we have it and it's very exciting. We are going to start delivering on, on those pathways. That's great. So Varun is back, uh, is with us now, uh, live from Washington DC, from State Department. So it'd be really interesting to hear from you what your takeaways have been during the General Assembly and to discuss the political uh, side of things as well. So, you know, in the most recent US presidential election, climate change was a top priority for the first time. President Biden has returned the US to the Paris Agreement and has also committed to net zero emissions by 2050. So we were really keen to hear from you. Where do we stand today in terms of global commitments? What is your theme? the sense you're getting at the General Assembly this week? Well, look, it, thanks so much for, for having me, first of all. Um, this is an exciting week, right? Uh, this is the culmination of close to a year of the Biden administration bringing the United States' leadership uh, back to the fore. As you mentioned, Laura, when the U.S. rejoined Paris on day one of President Biden's administration, we signaled, hey, we're back. Within one week, President Biden signed an executive order which put uh, climate change right at the center of foreign policy and national security. Secretary Kerry, who I work for, I, I'm his senior director for clean energy. Secretary Kerry is now the first principal ever to sit on the U.S. National Security Council completely dedicated to climate change. Within 100 days, we hosted the Leader Summit on Climate, which brought 55% of the world's GDP to the table with commitments that we were committed to keep 1.5 degrees Celsius alive. And ahead of Glasgow, COP26 in November, the goal is to get the whole world on board. We've already seen some really exciting announcements. We heard yesterday uh, from China, for example, about uh, ending support for overseas coal. And extremely excitingly, we heard President Biden share a new commitment about working with Congress to further double the U.S.'s commitment to climate finance around the world. Look, at the end of the day, this will be a whole of world effort to keep that 1.5C goal alive. We've spent the last nine months or so working with partners and like-minded partners and allies all over the world to get to the commitments we need, those enhanced nationally determined contributions or NDCs. Um, and, and many countries are making bold strides. Look, just last week, uh, Secretary Kerry uh, was in India. I was fortunate to get to, to be with him. And he launched a new U.S.-India Climate Action and Finance Mobilization Dialogue to help India reach its ambitious target of 450 gigawatts of renewable energy by 2030. That target is consistent with keeping 1.5C in play. And, and as Secretary Kerry expressed, we hope India communicates that target in a formal enhanced NDC by COP. So this week, we really saw a climate front and center at the UN General Assembly. It's a super exciting time because it's the culmination of a lot of work behind the scenes. Secretary Kerry has been all over the world. Uh, working with countries to get those commitments up. And, and I hope, Laura, we can talk in addition about what it'll take to actually meet those commitments, the implementation pathways to get to net zero by 2050. But, but I'll pause there. Uh, it's an exciting week. 
Well, it's really nice to hear such uh, optimism, which isn't always, doesn't always go hand in hand with this uh, topic we're discussing today. So thank you so much for that insight. Um, and that's, that sounds very promising and hopeful. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, let's move on to the pathways to de decarbonize um, uh, even more. So I'd like to bring in Michelle from uh, Boston Consultancy Group, because BCG has identified the critical role uh, of supply chains uh, in decarbonisation, as well as some specific recommendations that uh, companies should take. So why is this broader lens on supply chains so important, Michelle? So thank you for having me. So uh, of course, I, I share the enthusiasm uh, of Varun and, uh, and, and of Virginie about what's going on in the world. Uh, at the same time, we need to recognise what the challenges are so that we can de uh, develop the right solutions. I think, you know, one of the key words uh, to solve it is collaboration, because as we know, it's the whole system that needs to move from government developing policies, from the financial world financing, for corporate changing, and not the least, consumers changing behaviors and buying decarbonated, uh, decarbonated products. So collaboration is a key word. Now, when you look at you know, where the, the emissions come from, for most of the companies, not all the sectors, but if you look at it, a lot comes from scope three. Uh, in FMCG uh, companies, uh, clearly uh, the scope one and two emission only represent a fraction. And therefore, you know, getting to the right value chain type of uh, collaboration and investigation, I think is a key lever uh, to reduce emissions. Um, at the same time, when you look at the high emitting sectors, when you go into where it hurts the most, you take steel, you take cement, you end up by maybe 70, 80% of the cost, unit cost that is increasing. But when you transfer that to the whole value chain and you look to the, house, the cost of a house or the cost of a car, it's a couple of percentage points. So I think that you know, just that reveals the fact that only a value chain approach can help solve the problem because the steel companies, if they bear the cost just by themselves, are going to go bankrupt. And, and therefore getting a sense of overall how uh, the end product manufacturer having higher margins and getting closer to the consumer and therefore ability to educate consumers can also share the burden uh, to, get, uh, to get the impact. The, the other thing is, of course, uh, uh, most of these global companies that have made their pledges uh, the, you know, have a global footprint and global suppliers. And therefore, this is also a way to have influence on uh, other countries to make sure that they decarbonize if they want to continue uh, import uh, uh, export products uh, in Europe or in the US as the policies will uh, unfold. And that's why the importance of a carbon price and a carbon price at, at the border, even if it's complicated, will help. So uh, it requires close collaboration throughout the value chain. And, and, and other example, you take the, uh, you know, the electrical vehicle car and the, the end of the, the internal combustion engine. If you don't have the infrastructure that, that is being built at the same time, there's a chicken and egg type of uh, issue. I mean, both needs to come end in end, otherwise consumers are not going to buy those cars. So uh, I think overall, uh, we're uh, quite uh, bullish about you know, those value chain approaches where I think this is where collaboration and the new way of doing business uh, will uh, materialize, uh, hopefully, the sooner the better. Thank you. Now, you touched upon consumers, uh, which is such an important piece of, of the puzzle. And so I'd love to um, bring Virginie back in to talk about creating signals for green demand, because as is abundantly clear, this is a really complex topic and one where consumers often express concerns, of course, about climate change, but don't often know what to do about it. So how is PNG working to engage consumers on climate and also to strengthen demand for green products? Yes, very important question. Um, but often when um, you know we talk about this, people say, well, 
But before you ask consumers to do something different, can you tell us what you do yourself? You know, and, and this is why I will answer your question. But I always like to start with the emissions that we control directly. And how can we reduce those? And at the same time, just like Michel was saying, you know, send market signal and be a catalyst you know, for the industry. And um, so we have a goal, for instance, by 2030 to reduce our own emission by 50%. That's a science-based target. How do we do that? We need to buy 100% renewable electricity. You know? um, and, and since June, we have 97%. But the most important thing here is it's not just about buying uh, RECs. You know? It's about investing in long-term partnership so that we can create additionality on, on renewable energy. And we just signed a, a, a long-term uh, agreement with uh, ADP Renewables in Spain for two major projects, wind and solar, that's 120 megawatts. It's 40% of, of all the electricity needs for PNG Europe, you know, so that's massive. And so it's important to understand that by doing that, we actually accelerate uh, the, the decarbonization of the, uh, of the market. Um, so that's that in, in supply chain as well, just given another example, and I'll go to, to the consumer. Supply chain for us, it's 10 times the emission of uh, our operation. So you go from operation, then supply chain 10 times, and our commitment is net zero. And to get to net zero, this is where we need to work with our suppliers so that we replace all our fossil fuel-based carbon technology by either renewable or recycled or even capture carbon technology. This is massive innovation, you know, and by doing that, you send market signals of what is needed, you know, and, and what's interesting is that the building blocks exist today for many of those technology, but they are still needed to be proven at scale, you know, and, and like we work on, on Tide with a, with a Silicon Valley startup on capturing the atmospheric CO2 and integrating that in our detergent, you know. This is very exciting, but this is also uh, needed to be uh, proven at scale. Now, SDG 12, responsible consumption, you know, those are the emissions we do not control directly. And what is at stake here is really to help bridge the intention to action gap, because that is really what at stake. You know, Globescan just issued a, a recently a study showing that 46% of people want to seriously change their lifestyle to be more environmentally friendly, but only 22% are making active changes. You know, it's a 24 point gap. So why this gap? Because people um, don't want to compromise. They don't want to compromise on superior performance, on value or on convenience. And this is where a company like us touching 5 billion people around the world um, and investing a lot in innovation, we can help bridge that. So we can help develop, and it's both innovation and education. So again, it's not what we want consumers to do, is how through our innovation, we enable them to bridge that gap in tension to action. And for instance, that means developing a, a detergent technology that can clean in cold water as well as in warm, because the temperature of the wash cycle account for a big part of the carbon footprint of the detergent. And this is why IEL, for instance, in Europe has launched recently the Every Degree Makes a Different campaign. You know, it, it's to enable people and to inspire people to turn the dial down. And the, the goal is, you know, lowering the, the, the average wash temperature by five degrees. And it, it's a lot. Uh, it's about developing detergent that runs faster so that you can spend less time with heated water uh, in your shower. And so it's all about what we call making sustainability irresistible. So that that's the best alternative. You know, consumers go for it, even actually if they are not uh, environmentally conscious or if they don't make any change in their life, they will go there because it is the best proposal for them. Uh, and maybe just one word on the a program that is for us cross-sector, and I mention it because also the WEF is part of the coalition. It's called the 50 Liter Home Coalition. So it is, to Michel's point, it's a cross-value chain coalition. You know, all the player, energy and water, that have something to do with um, how people live in their home. And the idea is to reduce the amount of water 
to 50 liters per person per day. Today, it's about 150 liters in Europe. It goes up to 500 liters in the US. And doing that through innovation that allows water to be repurposed and recycled and enhanced so that it actually, 50 liter feels like it's 500 liter. You know, it's the delight for consumer. It's a better experience and they save water and heated water, so energy and water. That is interesting. And, um, I must say also the, the phrase making sustainability irresistible, I, I really like. And also as a communications professional, I must just add that I do believe there's a real... Um, perhaps in some, in some case, untapped uh, area of sort of looking at how you use communications to drive behavior change. So I just, uh, as, a, as I say, as a comms professional, I can't uh, not, not mention that, but uh, that's really interesting. And thank you so much. Um, and shocking to hear the amount of liters that is um, being used across the um, UK and the US. Now let's move on to how are we going to pull this off? In particular, what are the type of cap new capabilities and structures and also collaboration approaches that we need to really urgently advance? So, Michelle, let's start with you. Um, at BCG, you're working with many companies around the world um, and who are all sort of, you know, across a real broad set of industries. What new capabilities are needed here and what are some of the examples that you're seeing that show the most promise? Yeah, sure. So first, let me tell you, it doesn't touch all industries and all companies the same way. But I would say that uh, the first point is that the, the companies, most of our clients in 2030 will not look like uh, they look into in 2020. So it's a fundamental change of what the sources of competitive advantage, their product, their services, their operation is going to look like. So it's a full transformation we're talking about. So it touches everything from strategy to operation, to innovation, uh, to coalitions, et cetera. So, so uh, when we say new, new uh, capabilities, I think one, one thing that money cannot bear by is experience. And therefore, we are convinced there's a first mover advantage. And that's why we're so happy, uh, Varun, that uh, you've accepted us to work with you on the first mover coalition, because we're convinced that those first mover will build this experience because it's complex, because it's costly. When you move first on CCUS, on hydrogen, on direct air capture, you name it, you develop the experience and you go down the experience first before the others. So it's a question of developing the new capabilities and existing capabilities, deploying them into the new business. You've got, you know, Ofsted, they were offshore uh, oil and gas in the Nordic. They are the leader now in offshore wind. So they really transferred and built the new capabilities to do that. And, and that's uh, good examples of redeploying your capabilities, partnering with suppliers. I think that uh, Virginie uh, gave some very compelling example, but it's also beyond your own industry, thinking about you know, partnering locally uh, with the people that have too much waste to use their waste. It's, it's a question of how do you use your ecosystem and you foster innovation uh, at the local level in the way you didn't do it before. There is also a, a question of being able to do both bets. Because let's face it, it's not just about doing better what we've all, all, always been doing. There, there is a need for reinvention. And, and culturally, you know, you were talking Virginie, we're asking good engineers, that's what we have in our big corporations, to agree on commitments and they only know how to get to the commitments with some of the levers, but not all the levers. So they, they, they require some big bets so that we can start in, in innovation and making bets in advance. You know, I, I look at Maersk when they order for 1.4 billion uh, eight e-methanol powered vessels. This is a this is a big bet. So when when all companies are starting to really invest in the new world in advance of policies and probably in advance of what the other sectors, I think that they're really doing that in the right way. The other thing that I wanted to say on, 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 the, on, on the element where we see the winners really acting is because they're in advance, they can help policymakers shape the right policies. And that's a very important element because those policies, we need to be careful that they are really helpful in terms of developing you know, capabilities and innovation at the company level, and therefore acting and influencing them 
uh, as you are developing them, I think is an important element. So just to give uh, some example, I think these were some of the dimensions where you can really make the difference by being a first mover advantage. Always in mind, build experience because you're developing new sources of competitive advantage. So you can't rely on what you've done in the last 50 years or more. That's really interesting. Thank you so much. Um, now, I just, uh, I'd love to bring Varun back in because it'd be really interesting to get a sense of uh, the mentality at the US State Department and in particular, sort of your your sense on, on what works between when you're looking at approaching private and public collaboration. So what new types of partnerships and collaboration capabilities do you think we need between governments and the private sector in order for it to be more effective? Great, great question. And, and also, it's been wonderful to listen to Michelle and Virginie. And Michelle, thrilled to partner with you at BCG and thrilled to partner with the World Economic Forum on the First Movers Coalition. You guys will all hear a lot more about it um, in the coming weeks. But um, uh, to, to answer your question, let, let's just walk back. Like I told you, um, the United States has put climate change right at the center of our foreign policy. So this year, that means we're going to make a successful COP26 at Glasgow our top priority. We're going to get countries around the world to commit to ambitious climate targets. Next year, our focus shifts to implementation. It's the United States year of implementation. And that starts with uh, we are hosting the ministerial sessions of the Clean Energy Ministerial and Mission Innovation. We just held the Major Economies Forum, where leaders from around the world uh, got together on September 17th, and we committed to focus on clean energy targets uh, next year when we subsequently reconvene it. We'll also chair the International Energy Agency. So the, the idea is next year we're focused on getting the countries around the world who have all made ambitious commitments, and we're one of them. We made a commitment to reduce our emissions by 50 to 52% in 2030. The goal is to get every country together to accomplish the raised ambition. Now, we know what we need to do. Look, I, I come from the energy field, and energy, as you know, is 75% of emissions. So I'll, I'll focus on the clean energy transition. The clean energy transition kind of segments into two main topics, right? And both have clear deliverables in this critical decade between now and 2030. The first main branch is deployment. We have a bunch of technologies that are commercially ready to go. They're cost effective, wind and solar power and electric vehicles and batteries. It's time to deploy the heck out of them. And that's what we can do between now and 2030. Just to give you a sense of scale, the International Energy Agency tells us that we'd have to build the world's biggest solar farm every day between now and 2030 to be on the right deployment pace where we're quadrupling solar and wind deployment, 1,000 gigawatts or more per year by 2030. But that's kind of one brand. We know what to do there. And 80% of the reductions we need to get to by 2030 are going to come from technologies we already have. The other branch, though, which is equally important and which Michelle just talked about, is innovation. Innovation is going to represent 50% of the emissions reductions we'll need for net zero by 2050. Think about that again. In 2050, 50% 50 of the reductions, if we've achieved our goal of keeping 1.5C within reach, 50% will have come from technologies that today are not ready for market. And Michelle named several of them and so did Virginie. That means that in this decade, we need to bring those technologies to scale. And we do that in a couple ways. One way is we invest in research and development and demonstration governments and private companies around the world. This is a very important thing that governments can do. Before I joined the Special Presidential Envoy for Climate in the Biden administration, I wrote a book called Energizing America, which laid out a pathway for the U.S. to ramp up its clean energy research development and demonstration investment. Of course, President Biden has actually announced an even larger target, $35 billion in R&D, and the bipartisan infrastructure bill would uh, increase funding for critical areas, carbon dioxide removal, carbon capture and utilization, industrial decarbonization, by four and 10 times what the targets were that we set and what we thought was an aspirational book. So it's, it's an exciting time, as, as I would say. Um, but second, in addition to the supply side, investing in the new technologies, we need to do what Michelle just said, which is create the demand signals. The demand signals for emerging technologies that aren't yet on the market, but could be. And this has worked beautifully in other fields. Look, the reason we have COVID vaccines today is because governments around the world set demand signals. They said, look, if you make these vaccines, we will buy them. 
We'll set a price. We'll set a performance parameter. They have to work. They have to be safe. And then we will buy the loads of them. And companies met the challenge. The same thing happened in space flight. The first commercial crewed uh, space flight happened thanks to a private company, SpaceX, because NASA set out clear performance milestones and said, if you meet them, we will buy that flight. In energy, the First Movers Coalition is doing this with the private sector. We're saying, look, if you're a private company, you get a lot of inbound. People are telling you to do all kinds of things. They're telling you to go net zero. They're telling you to report your carbon emissions, all kinds of things. They're telling you to decarbonize your supply chains, right? You're supposed to do careful accounting to figure out if you should buy a Dell Latitude or an Apple MacBook. What's the number one highest leverage thing you can do? It's to create a demand signal for the technologies that we'll need in 2050, that 50% of emissions reduction that we're not in a position to achieve today. And companies that join the First Movers Coalition with us, they're going to set those commitments. They'll say, you know, a small percentage of the steel I buy or the cement or the trucking that I ship freight on or the aviation that I fly my executives on, I'm going to make sure that I send the clear demand signal that we've got to have zero emissions technologies by 2030. It won't be a big market, but it'll be an early market that paves the way for the scale up of these technologies by 2050. And of course, in addition to the voluntary private sector commitments, we'll also work on the public sector side through initiatives like the G7 Industrial Decarbonization Agenda to create demand from the public side. Altogether, we know the milestones we gotta hit. We know we'll need 100 to 400 million tons of near zero carbon steel by 2030. It's time to hit them through public-private partnerships and through multilateral cooperation. Brilliant, thank you. Now. We are almost out of time, um, but I do want to get a last word from each of you. So with COP26 less than six weeks away, what should be our top priorities coming out of that moment? Um, Virginie, can we start with you? Yes, and I, I want to say that, um, you know, the power of COP26 for me is the run up to it. <laughs> I mean, is the fact that we are talking today it's all these reports that have uh, been launched and the commitment that have been made um, that, that will actually um, create nothing more than magic, you know. So it's not like uh, before and after it will be totally different. But I think that now we have uh, people across the value chain that are committed to go to net zero. And uh, again, I would like to reinforce the two key pillars for this to happen is innovation, which by the way, doesn't need to be space-like innovation. You know, you have some very, very smart innovation like uh, replacing, you know, that 20% of trucks in Europe basically are empty, you know, <laughs> and, and so they have an empty container. So we work with this uh, startup that fold, 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 it's called, they, they fold containers. So you can have four instead of one. I mean, those type of very smart innovation at scale can make the difference. And the other one is indeed uh, cross-value chain collaboration. And collectively, we need to learn how to do that uh, at the pace and purpose that, that, that we need. Um, so I believe that COP26 is just another step in, in this uh, big momentum that we are seeing. And uh, now it's uh, not just the pledges, but on to the plans. Great. Michelle, what about you? The first aspect is delivery, okay? Uh, we've, we've done the pledges, now we need to deliver, exactly as Baron was saying. And, and the, the delivery, so for me, the, the COP is not an end. It's the continuation of a process, but really now, the focus from pledges to delivery. With the mindset of accelerating, we are late. Huh? The IPCC says we reach 1.5 degrees in 2040 now. I mean, so acceleration. Acceleration means changing the context in terms of policy, in terms of financing, in terms of demand creations and signal. So we need to accelerate. And the third word is collaboration. It's public-private, it's vertical, it's horizontal, it's between countries. It's a, a, a big learning exercise that we need to apply to ourselves, which is to foster the collaboration because we've got the same objective at the end. It's one planet. So really, these, four, these three words are the key. Then, uh, because we're, we, we're in a high risk of not getting there, 
you need adaptation. And, and I know that probably the COP uh, next year, I mean, will be in Africa. I think we need to talk about adaptation and include in the, in the, in the, in the plans of the countries an adaptation uh, component that already today doesn't really exist. And that, by the way, represents a huge market as well for companies, you know, because there's going to, to be a, a huge market for that as well. And then to finalize, uh, I think that the more and more I discuss with, with companies and states, if we don't solve the just transition in a, in, a, in a fair way, and it's not just north-south, it's north-south, but it's within each of the countries. It's not because I'm French and I got the yellow jacket. This is going to happen everywhere. So we need to also think that uh, they are, not everyone will be uh, affected the same way, and we need to think about the vulnerable population just to make sure that they are part of the journey and, and otherwise it won't happen. Thank you. Now, Varun, a very quick final verdict from you, please. Yeah, absolutely. Look, three big things at COP. The number one thing is raising ambition. We want countries around the world to communicate enhanced NDCs. Thing two, the core negotiations. We've got to conclude the rule book under which the Paris Agreement is going to function going forward. And thing three, the COP is the biggest platform for climate. And frankly, it's going to be the biggest conference convening since the pandemic at all. So this is a chance for companies, countries, and other organizations to use that platform and signal real action. Not the kind of greenwashing things that we're worried about, but real action. First Movers Coalition is one of those. Um, but there will be a range of exciting announcements at COP26. Uh, look forward uh, to sifting through and finding the most impactful ones. Thanks for having me on. No, thank you so much for uh for, well, for all your contributions, and I'm, I'm for one, and I'm so excited for COP26, not least, well, for everything we've just discussed, but also, as you say, it is the first gathering since, since the pandemic. Um, thank you all so much uh, for coming on. Michelle, Varun, Virginie, you've given us a really great understanding of the work that lies ahead. Uh, thank you so much for joining and for all the work uh, that you're doing to lay the foundation uh, to navigate these pathways to net zero. Um, um, this is the end of a web stream, but um, as this is such a critically important piece uh, of work at the forum uh, and for our forum partners, please stay on because uh, we want to have some further discussion with you in a slightly more informal setting. Thank you all very much. <laughs>